Uh, it's us, your favorite podcast. Uh, today we have the, the usual three, myself uh, and my two lovely and ruggedly handsome co-hosts. William. And Katie. This week we are reading Children of Blood and Bone by, oh my God, I blinked on the author's name. Tomi Ariyemi. It's a book Katie and I have both been interested in reading previously, pitched it to Will, Will agreed. Reluctantly. With slight reluctance. More like, unfortunately. <laughs> That's what reluctantly kind of infers. I'm gonna just put this out there as a little morsel for later in the conversation. This book made me realize that I don't like YA. And I should tell you something. Readers, I want you to know, this is something I have known for years, but for some reason, Will thought he was YA trash. What he actually is, my dear lovely listeners, is fan fiction trash. Two very different things. He often would complain to me. He would say, man, adult fiction and fantasy can be so dry. I wish the ideas were more fresh, like the YA novels or something like that. But YA, YA novels aren't as mature or well-recognized. So in between is our fan fiction world, which is where Will and I resided for far too long. I reject this framing entirely from both of you. I will say this, I had always assumed that it was elitist to say that YA was not as good as adult fiction. I always felt like I wasn't one of those snooty people that I did like YA because I like a lot of the tropes. And I thought, you know what, any book any genre can be written well. But what I have now realized is that I should stop going to children's Little League games and complaining about how the children are not very good at the game. They're never gonna be that good at the game, guys. They're never gonna play as well as adults. What he is looking for in books is not YA. What Maria helped me realize in this transition in my life, somewhat um, smugly, I might add, and not in a way that is supportive as a friend, is that there are good writers who write YA, but as a genre, I am not here for the poor writing. That is not what I said. Uh, I just said <laughs> he doesn't like Y. YA, for me, has a level of like wish fulfillmentness and like a candy aspect to it, which is why I return to it very often. Um, it's why a lot of the times when I have read, because like I have read way, way more not YA stuff in the past few years than Will has. When I've read those other books, they have a, a drier and a little bit of a slower quality to them. We'll discuss this more as we go, but my basic thing is that I'm gonna criticize this book a lot, but I think that this is a good book for 14 to 18 year olds. Or Maria's. No, if you're okay with YA in general, this book will be good for you. I think it's poorly written, but- Arguable. There are certain things that I don't think are okay to be bad in because you're YA. So like pacing, for example, that's not a problem this book has, but if it had poor pacing, I think that's an okay thing to lay at its doorstep. But one of my biggest issues was just how blunt and obvious the thoughts of the characters were. And that's okay in YA. Like I should not be expecting subtlety in the character's thoughts from YA when YA is geared towards talking to children. Or that the characters are children. All right, hold on. The book also has a like a, a torture scene in it. So when we say children, it's like, 14 to 18. Background information, Tomi Ariyemi is, this is her first novel ever published. Yes. The fact that this is her first novel, this is a stellar freaking novel. It's fantastic for a, first, for a first one. It is exactly what you might expect from a first novel debut. Ignoring Will for a second, how did you feel about this book as personally for you as a reader? The most engaging chapter was the first one. That, okay, that's fine, I don't care. That's how I feel. That's a, uh, subjectively, I don't care what anybody else thinks. I think the first chapter is stellar. I think it really sets a really good colorful tone. We get some characters, we get the, we smell it. I can smell the world in that one. Unfortunately, I do think this book has pacing problems. I think there's a lot of good things, uh, great world bu building. She does really good vivid images. The t pace is brisk and it is actually quite good, but unfortunately, I don't think it provides for the characters like it could have if it had slowed down. The brutality, like we've mentioned in Torture, is lovely. It, uh, I think without it, we wouldn't actually get the emotional impact of the brutality of uh, the two, like, not races, but the two, uh, the magic users and non-magic users and such. For me, I agree with Katie. I The pacing is super brisk and it picks up immediately and goes. But as you guys know, or you should if you've watched any of our videos, I like me some time and a little bit more like for me 
I like a, a little bit more of what the person's life was like before the plot starts. So you get a feel for uh, some of the stuff. I also think that some of the character beats, they're fine here. I enjoyed them. I just... I read the book, but I think if she would have slowed them down and would have extended some things, it would have worked better for me overall and potentially impacting the second book, which we haven't read yet, but I will read. But I enjoyed it. I, I had fun reading it. I found the ending very impactful. I liked a lot of the imagery there. Again, I think it could have been more impactful if things had been slowed down and approached a little bit differently. It is by far not a perfect book, but I enjoyed it. It was it was a fun read. And, and for me, subjectively, I didn't enjoy reading it. And I don't think it does a lot of things very well. I think that certain aspects of that are okay, because it is YA. I think that the book skates by a lot on melodrama. Hilariously, I think the pacing is pretty well. Like I didn't I don't have any complaints about the pacing. Will and I uh, do not always agree on books quite regularly do not agree on books. I don't know how we've gotten this far in this this podcast. No, no, no. Because what happens is we agree on good books and we agree on really bad books, but we don't agree on mediocre books. That's really the problem is that if a book is middling, I tend to go, okay, I don't like this. And if it's middling, you tend to go, oh, I do like this. Excuse you guys, include me in the comparison. Jesus Christ, what am I? All right, did you bring up Pistola? <laughs> me and Maria have this thing where when we disagree, we say we're going to meet in the podcast. Pistols at Dawn. It's because we were talking about the book and I said swords at dawn, Will. And he goes pistolas. Because of my Hispanic heritage. And I would like to say that I brought several. So you may choose your annihilation, Maria. You may have the Boltock pistol from Gears of War. You may have Han's blaster from Star Wars. You may have the smart pistol from Titanfall 2. Choose your death. I'll, I'll take Hans. A classic. I'll take, I'll take a classic. Thank you. Let's hit us with the plot, Maria. This book is set. I'm just going to start with the general setting before we get into the actual plot. So this is set in a West African inspired fantasy. Specifically, uh, the author talks about how she grew up. She's Nigerian and she grew up in a Nigerian uh, household. And so it's Nigerian inspired. Some of the locations are from Nigeria. And then specifically the language that they speak spells in is one of the main languages used. Yoruba. Yeah. And another thing is, is she also did some exploring on African like mythology. And that's how she discovered the Orisha. And she was like, wow, it's the African version of like deities that control the elements. And so that's also ironic it's because i'm sure it will at some point will explain just like the author herself says that it's very much like avatar the last airbender it's a lot like it at the beginning indeed she was inspired in many ways that way continue maria so yeah you're set in a country of orisha and um orisha had uh magic so there was there's two types of people there's the magi and diviners, diviners are baby mandrai who haven't like manifested their powers yet. And then there is the Kosudan, which are the uh, orations without magic, and they have different looks. So the diviners slash magi have darker skin and white hair. So it's very noticeable immediately who that and then the um, Kosudan have more like almondy skin and like goldish eyes. The royal family used to be magi and then they did something to upset. So you, you get your magic from the gods. There's a bunch of different gods that each have different powers that they bestow to the magi who are there. So there's like burners who are fire, there are reapers who like death. There are cancers, which are literally like illness people, welders, all, all different types. Um, and that's how the book opens. You actually just get a description of all the different the gods and magi and what their powers are. And the royal family of Orisha used to be magic users. They were magi, but then they got too like cocky. They There's an imbalance of power. Yes, an imbalance of power. They, they started getting a bit corrupt. So the gods took their magic away because they used to be magic and now they're not. Once magic was taken away from the royal family, uh, it started getting like magic users started getting vilified because there's a power imbalance. Like here you are ruling a kingdom, but there are other people who are potentially more powerful than you. So they started persecuting the magi and it all culminated into in this like super terrible night where magic suddenly disappeared and there was a raid and the royal army just killed all the magi. Like all the adult magic users dead and all their little diviner children babies were just like suddenly orphans. And it's really violent, very traumatic. And that is the the situation that births our main character. Her name is Zaylee. She, uh, her mother was a reaper. Her dad is just 
a non-magic user. When she was young and the raid happened, her mother was taken and killed before her eyes and strung up in a tree. Yeah, and uh, specifically though in this scene, what's important is that for some reason her mother can't use her powers plus the idea that she is actually bound up in a special chain um, that's essentially like their kryptonite. And it's called Magicite. And um, it wouldn't allow her mother to use her magic. And that's what they used. And the king later explains that he took this idea from another nation or region and utilized it in his plot to overtake the Magi. Specifically, he also talks about how in those regions, which are like Portugal and England, essentially, that the Magi have like completely destroyed the land and like ruined everything. But the only version of this we get is from him. So it's somewhat suspect in terms of what the legitimacy of that is. Her home life situation, which you don't get immediately like in the first scene, but you realize it and I think it, it'll be better for the context of my explanation is her dad, ever since her mother's death, has been a bit off where like he will just have like his brain will just turn off sometimes. And so they, her and her brother have to take care of him and cannot leave him alone. But her brother has his life and she has her life and they're both trying to do stuff and it creates some tension between them. And so then the story actually opens. And the whole thing with Zaylee is that she has the white hair of a Magi, now no longer Magi. Now they're just white haired lower class citizens. And they are overtaxed, they're pressured, Super, super, as Maria would say, racism. You know, it, that is what's happening, but with magic and stuff. And so anyway, Zaylee is only 13, I think. She's like 16, 17. So we have our opening scene, which is honestly, I, I think I got to say my favorite chapter out of the whole book. It's a very formulaic scene. It's because I've seen many like this, but this one has a different taste to it, which I really enjoyed. We have a whole bunch of young women. Most of them are diviners, but you know, there's also not um, just young women as well. And they are sparring and they use staffs to spar with one another. And Zaylee, it wants to graduate from this program, which is led by this older woman named uh, Mama Agba. And she's like this old wizened fashionista who makes really nice clothing. And that's how she's able to pay the taxes she has to pay. It's because she supports all of the uh, diviners and such. And so the guards focus on her. What you don't know at this time is she was once upon a time a magi, but you can kind of already read into it. It's because, I mean, she's empathizing with them a lot. Tropes. Tropes. And so anyway, they're sparring and they even have sparring dummies and everything. But then all of a sudden, <gasps> guards. Okay, so here's the thing. Already I hate it. So what happened is, and this is one of the things that off put me to the novel as a whole, is in the beginning, she's going to spar, but there's this really bitchy bully girl who like says mean things about her racially and like she beat like oh i hate her and like that character is so overused and blunt as an instrument that i immediately was like no i'm on her side because i'm just con i'm like i'm obstinate and contrary like that when i, I don't like it when authors tip their hand too much so that kind of off put me right off the bat for the characters in the book I can see your point. And also I do have gripes with introducing this kind of like, uh, what's the rival? Word? Rival, thank you. This, not I, now I'm focusing too much on this scene just because I love it. But her rival is named, she's given a personality and a background and she's never used again. And I just was like, what a missed opportunity. Why didn't she go off on the adventure with them? And then she could have been like friends with a, uh, another character who's of Roy or... This character's not of royalty. She just, she's essentially the bastard child of like- That would have been way cooler. You're right. Wouldn't it have been pretty sick yeah. for them to go? Because then it, we could have had learning and understanding. And there's also a lot of like catty fights between the women, which could have been interesting. Yeah, so I agree. I thought this person was going to be the person. And this is where I will say, this is one of my issues with this scene is- for me, at the start of a book, I want to get a really good feel for the character's life. This scene gives me a really good feeling for a particular aspect of the character's life, but a lot of time is given to this rival who is a Kosudan, who calls her a maggot, who all that stuff, and then never- Maggot is, maggot is the slur against diviners slash magi. And- she just never comes up again. And like another character, there's a little girl who like forgot to tell everyone the guards were coming on time and she gets brought up again and we get an ending. It's a sad ending, but we get an ending for that little girl. Her name's VC. Um, 
but not the rival. And like, it's a whole, that is the rival and her fight with the rival is the entire focus of the first scene. Like she's ready for graduation. Mama. It's so important. It's like, who's going to fight today? And she's like, Zaley, it is your chance. And Zaley's like, this is my moment. I've been waiting for this for years. I'm going to beat the crap out of this other girl. And they fight and Zaley like. Pretty much wins, almost wins. And this other girl is incredibly skilled, which also the fact that we're told that she's so skilled, that she comes from, uh, you know, that she's the hidden child of a royal family or a lord of some sort. And so she's got lighter skin and she considers, maybe considers herself above other people. You could have played into the idea that she pretends she thinks she's higher only because she feels like she can't fit in. And that could have gone and she could have connected with the princess that later joins them. There's so much. But anyway, my point is, though, is that the guards come in and then they start interrogating, like, what are you guys doing? The taxes have been higher, like exorbitant. It perfectly sets up the world immediately. We have the women. We have the place of our character. We have. But then I feel like it does not stay that firm throughout the novel. But anyway. So uh, she has the guards come in. They're like, pay the taxes. Mama Agba's like, I don't got no money. Um, and they end up dealing with the guards. Zaley, this is where you get like the introduction to Zaley's personality, which is good heart, but brash and hot headed because like she picks a fight with the guards and Mama Agba has to be like, listen, Zaley. Stop. <laughs> you need to use your head. I'm training you to fight so you can defend those who can't defend themselves. Why the heck are you trying to defend me? The other problem is, as I mentioned in Duskborn, the this archetype of a character I feel is very tired. The brash, headstrong, but like, you know, kind of character. I- it, I, it bothers me because it's just, I don't find it very distinctive and I don't find it actually has like that much personality. Because you've seen it so many times. Also it is for me is that it feels like it's an author insert that they're like, oh, this is gonna be a really cool badass character. But wait, they need a weakness. I'll make them kind of a little arrogant. Like it to me, it feels like, like that's the kind of character I would write as an author insert and then be like, oh, but wait, also it's not totally a good thing how awesome they are all the time. That's kind of my issue with it. What ends up happening is like uh, someone comes and is like, you left your father alone and shit's bad. And she's like, oh no. And again, so this is an example. We have two examples in the first like couple of chapters of Zaley being brash and hot headed. She picks a fight with the guards. She left her father alone so she could do graduation, even though it was her brother's day to go do stuff. Um, and by the time they find uh, their father, he is literally drowning. Zane has to save him. It's a really like tense scene. Zane is her brother. Zane is her brother. And the important thing about the scene is you get a little bit more background to her mother. Something similar happened to Zane when he was young, and her, her, her mother used blood magic to save Zane. And then Zane is all mad at her for like leaving them. But the reason their dad was drowning in the water was because of that terrible tax for the maggots again. They now have to pay the tax. And they're like, how are we going to do it? It's so much money. She's like, I'll go to the big city and I'll sell our really cool fish and that should buy us enough money. I would have liked a little more of uh, like Naomi Novik's <laughs> description of Barbara. Yes, Ring. I would have loved I, that. I, I, I like slowing down. I like feeling what the character's life was like before the book starts. And some people like Will, Will like starting his plots when the shit starts. I'm, I'm starting like couple days before. Here's the deal. First off, I agree with you. I would have liked to see more of Zell in her natural habitat. It's like, what hobbies does she have? What friends does she have? She feels like a very shallow character to me. Actually, almost all of them do, except for Amari. But no, I don't start my stories when the main incident begins. There's a saying that you should start your story as close to the middle as possible. I start exactly at that. Like I start them way too early. Like usually you should have like a day of normal stuff happening before the inciting incident. No, mine is like two days after the inciting incident. It's a hilarious problem. I mine have. is like a week before. Yeah. Like I just want shit to start. Maria and I once wrote Lord of the Rings fan fiction together and literally we were co-writing it. And the first 30 pages is like one day. But it's also because here's the thing. We're about to everything I'm going to tell you and I'll tell you when it stops is one day of plot like it, 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 she does that but we did it like spread over a very like ours was slow languid you, you got a feel for the life the that stuff this is like go 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 and that's just me as a writer I like I like having and a reader I like having that time before the plot starts will starts like 
two days after. We already have one character dead. Yeah. Like, no, I mean, in one of my series, it like in one of my books, it literally is like a week or two after a big event happened, and I'm just catching you up because I want, I don't want, I don't like being bored. Start the story. I want to be interested. There's a lot of shit to do in life. And I'm the opposite. I I do not want that. Like I want to see what your life was like. I want to care about the stuff. I'm a little in between, depends on how you do it. She goes to Lagos um, now. Which is the big city. Yeah, Lagos is the big city. It's also the capital city where like the kings are. And so her brother's like, this is dangerous. Be careful, Zell. But I have to cut in because you get another character's point of view. Her name is Amari. She is the princess of Orisha. And my favorite character. And my favorite character. And everyone's favorite character. Amari is <laughs> the best. <laughs> she has scenes of like, oh, uh, if you want character growth, mwah, Amari's it. Like, congratulations, go home. After Maria's done giving you the summarized version of what happens to, with her intro, I would just like to make a comment on what, like, seriously guys, Amari, I really wish, I really wish we had a little bit like- We'll talk more about the POV issues that I had with the book, but I honestly yes. think the book would be much stronger if it was just Amari's POV. I really do. That would be hard, but I would like it. It's not, it's, we could just jettison a lot of the dumb parts. I take it back. That actually could totally work. I don't think it would do what the author wanted. The author wanted the no, point of view. No, it would not. Of no. one of the people being subjugated. She didn't want... What she didn't want was, so there's this thing that happens in Holocaust movies where a lot of Holocaust movies, the main character is not- The Schindler's List problem. Yeah. The main character is not one of the people being oppressed or dealing with anything. It's the, they have a term for it, like the charitable or the good, like non-Jewish person. And that's who the main character is. And having Omari as the main character would have done that. And I super think this author did not want that. That's actually what my thought was as well. It's difficult though, because sometimes it's like that you want a character who's new to a situation because then everything gets explained to them and it doesn't feel like background info, like, and they enter the story at a certain point, but it is problematic. This book also is very, there's a part at the end uh, where the author specifically talks about how this book was her attempt to work out a lot of the frustration and anger and feelings of helplessness with black people getting shot for no reason in uh, America at the time. And so this book, and I'll talk about how I think that actually hurts the book a little bit, but that's this book is very aware of those kinds of issues. You could argue, and because Will is going to make an argument about the point of views, and Katie also had a comment, like you could argue that these are the only point of views you need. You needed Amari and you needed Saley. But anyway, back to Amari. She's at dinner. She's a princess. Her mother is real annoying. Amari doesn't fit in with her life. Her best friend is her diviner maidservant, who she loves, named Binta. Really loves, we find out later. Really loves. Really, 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 really loves. Really loves. And man, was that not done well? It was. I loved it. You don't see Binta in this scene, but there's a sense that she's missing. Like Amari is just sitting at dinner, like trying not to be awkward. She doesn't like speaking up. Her mom keeps pushing her into things. Her mom has like, her skin is a bit too dark. So her mom kept putting powder on it. She's a little too fat. She likes desserts too much. So her mom will literally take her desserts away. So you get this idea that Amari doesn't fit in with her household. The one person that she feels like she fits in is Binta. And she keeps looking for Binta. And then in the middle of the dinner, she's like, oh no, I let Binta have my pretty necklace so she could sell it to keep her family out of the stocks because of the maggot tax. And the stocks are a really awful place to go. It's just slavery. It's sold as indentured servitude. Once you pay off your debt, then you're fine. But no, you die. You die. You go to the stocks and you die unless you happen to be a palace servant. And Amari realizes that it, like, because somebody mentions that Binta's been taken into the throne room with her dad. And her dad is... I call him Papa Batty because he is he is the big bad. He is the tyrant. He's the the one who's like trying to kill all of the um, magic users. He's he's the one who abuses his children. Fire Lord. Fire Lord. Yeah. Fire Lord Ozai. But Fire Lord Ozai was like, I just want to rule everything. This guy has tragic backstory, which we'll get to. And she's like, Oh my god. My dad's probably gonna kill Binta if he found her with that necklace. They'll think she stole it. So she runs and she's terrified. This is a really good example of who Amari is as a character. So one thing I'll say this book does is that it's point of view characters, mainly for Zaley and Amari. They do a really good job describing what their personalities are, whether you like those personalities or not, in the first few chapters. I'd argue they don't do as well for Anon. It takes a minute for his- But I also would like to point out, this is, a, again, 
This is a really a compliment to Tomi Ariemi's uh, writing skill, just in this one little tiny moment, because Amari's not thinking of Binta straightforward, but you can tell it's bothering her, bothering her. So you can tell how important it is. And then when she's running to go find her in panic, she's like, she almost stops. And she's like, my father might actually really hurt me. And then she's like, but no, Binta is more important. I love her. And that is so fascinating. Like that already straight up tells you who she is. Yeah, and it gives you like, she's scared, she's terrified, and she's terrified of her father. But she's like, no, Binta would do it for me. She would put herself in harm's when she has before for me. So I've, I've got to do this for her. And she like busts in. And instead of seeing like Binta being whipped for stealing something, it's Binta holding a scroll. Uh, well, it's it's the general lady being like, we found the scroll, it washed up. And Papa's like, I thought you destroyed it. And she's like, it didn't work. We threw it into the ocean. But if people touch it, they get magic. And the general lady is actually the king's lover. Admiral Nagger is what I call her because she nags in on to no end throughout oh the Oh my f- Oh my god. Oh my god. Inan. Listening to the audiobook was so awful. Inan, Inan, Inan. That was half her dialogue, which I have a lot to say about. But her name is Kaya. She's like, seems like this very fierce warrior woman and she does not live up to that i'm sorry general kaya is uh, like we couldn't destroy it but it's giving magic to the, the the diviners and he's like let me see and they bring binta in because she's the only diviner that works in the palace this was mentioned before they hand her the scroll as she touches it beautiful lights start to spark from her hand and uh, uh mari is watching this and she's been told her whole life magic is terrible awful if it happens, we're all going to die. And as she's watching it, uh, and, and she's always been kind of sympathetic. She she loves Binta. Binta's her most, like, important person. So she never thought Binta was a bad person. It's literally her only, the only person who really loves her truly. And it's beautiful. She watches these lights cascading. She realizes that there's a term for the people that can control light and stuff like that. Um, and she realizes she's one of those. And it's beautiful and magical and her breath is t- taken away and then her father kills Binta. Doesn't he slit her throat? He slits her throat. I don't know if it was him or one of his guards, but he orders it. So essentially, Binta is fridged. And I have words because fridged all my life. Fridge has been a term for when a female character dies so that a man can have man pain and guilt about it, right? And it was a misogynistic construct. I want to point out that this is the fourth book written by a woman where a, 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 the main female character is motivated by either their sister or a sister-like character dying and not really being a character. In this one, she's more of a character. Yes! Dustborn, Children of Blood and Bone, and I'm already blanking on the other one. The Wrath and the Dawn. The Wrath and Dawn. So, okay, maybe chill with that a little bit. It's a little odd that it's, like, so endemic. Fair enough. I didn't even, I, I, I think I subconsciously noticed this, but this is the best done oh, one. Oh, absolutely. Like, this is the so one. So I'll argue that it takes a little bit for you to feel like Binta's a real character. Uh, it, it does happen, but it felt like, okay, that could have even moved up a little bit, but that's really just a nitpick. I agree a little bit with that. Like, you really get some scenes where you feel who Binta is, and it happens a little bit later. For Katie, that first scene and the lack of Binta annoying a so much really gave her what the relationship was. I'm sorry, I'm speaking for yes. you. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. But anyway, she watches Binta die. She's really upset. And the scene cuts. She's in shock. She's in shock. She's in absolute shock. No, the scene doesn't cut just yet. Does Because she wanders away. And so she's like in total full on PTSD mode. And she's like shell shock. And so she's just like a ghost walking. And at this point, Kaya... Kaya. Kaya had uh, brought the scroll up into her quarters and plot hole here. The scroll is in her quarters, which are unlocked, unguarded, not in any type of security. What the heck is up with that, by the way? But anyway, uh, Amari goes up. She sees the scroll and she's like, oh, my God, like this can bring magic back. And this actually makes sense to me with that shell shock, with her love for Binta, with Binta being so brutally murdered, that she actually takes the scroll. And as we learn in another chapter that's about to come up, she runs away with it, which fair point. There's nothing keeping her there. Everyone's in. And also she hates her dad. Like there's, it's not one of those situations 
where she has love for her father, she has no closeness. Her her brother and non is a different story, and we'll talk about that. But anyway, but that that's still a stressed relationship, and she barely sees a non because he's off trying to become the captain of the, the uh, arm. Yeah. yeah, the guards or army or whatever. We go back to Amari. Amari's like, I'm gonna go to Lagos. I'm gonna sell this fish. She goes. No, no. Uh, Zaley goes off to do this, and uh, Zane's like, don't don't mess this up. She sells the fish. Everything is good, and then a girl comes and grabs her and is like, help me, they're gonna kill me. And there's guards chasing her. And she's like, I shouldn't do this, but Mama Agba trained me to help people who can't help themselves. And, and like in her head, she's like, no, nah, I should I should just mind my business, go back and help my family. But she's like, no, nah, I can't. Like this girl is literally being chased by a bunch of guards. And she's like, the girl's like, they're gonna kill me. And so she like runs her out and they end up getting like hemmed in and it's a whole thing. Zane ends up flying in over the wall with Nyla, who is Which is their 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 very cool horned large lioness. This thing. book has Appa. giant animal creatures. Yeah, Appa. It's it's like Appa. Appa. Um it, it's called the Lionar. Lion Air. It's got big horns and she's like, uh, Zaylee raised her from a cup. But anyway, and so he ends up like, they end up escaping with the girl and Zane's like, what did you do? And she's like, this girl found me and I couldn't leave her. I wanted to point out that during the scene when Zane rescues the two girls um, and they leap over uh, Inan, who is essentially being introduced here. Yes, let me finish and you can say all you want. There is this one point in that moment where uh, when Inan looks up, he notices Zaylee, and he they have like a zing moment, you know, like the slowdown, the rose petals, the sparkles. And uh, Inan kind of feels like this crazy pull, and so does Zaylee. Now, at first I was like, is there going to be some type of like foretold soulmates thing going on here? Um, but then you later are told that Amari had bumped into her brother with the scroll and the scroll touches him. And as we later learn, he has magic. And so the scroll had awakened the magic within him and his magic is thought reading and such. So when he sees Zaylee, and I'm assuming since she's a uh, magi or not a magi yet, but uh, a diviner, that he has a connection with her. So that better explained it for me. But good Lord, at first I was like, oh no. No, I hate it still. <laughs> it's this book has a thing where Anan and Zeli have like this super like, oh, they feel attracted to I each know. other all the time. And he can't get her sea salt smell because I swear to God. God, that's mentioned 90 times out of his mind and her and her brown skin and flashing eyes. I hated it. I'll talk, talk more about how much I hated the romance in this later and how overwrought it is. But this is the first taste of it you get. This is kind of like if Zuko and Katara, but like early on in their personalities had had a crush on each other. For me, I think this could have worked because I also I don't love it as like a romantic usage. Um, I think if he had more interactions with other people like because there, there's a moment where he smells kaya the general and he like he his he's a connector he connects with people emotionally and mentally that's his powers you don't initially think it has some combat capabilities but it does had they had a couple of similar moments where he like connected with other people to the same extent because it's never explained why because katie's right it, it's explained as magic something in his magic attached itself to zaley but you never know why was it like the heightened situation if so why doesn't this happen with anybody else and maybe like it switches like once he connects with someone else it like the the super deep connection with somebody else fades and that doesn't happen so it does feel a little like i won't say insta love because they still don't like each other and like argue all the time for a while but it, it does feel like insta attraction but yeah so they fly over they run back to illarine which is where zaylee and zane live and they find out amari's the princess and zaylee immediately is like fuck you fuck the horse you rode in on you suck your family sucks i cannot believe i risked my life and my family for you and zane's super upset about all of this but he also is kind of like he's like the empathetic empathetic to the princess who is terrified out of her goddamn mind and obviously she's trying to do something here and yeah i really wish zane and her there's a lot to say i'll get to say it later but i wish zane actually had started off with like a cool disinterest with her it's because that would have made a little bit like i imagine he probably feels a, a like empathetic towards her because she's small and like 
really nervous and probably beautiful. And so um, very fragile looking. And that can actually be like later on that breaks him down or maybe he gets annoyed with it, but then they like her strength comes up and like then it kind of like they connect. Because this is the other romantic pairing. Yes. And it is, uh, it's whatever. It's it's there. I like theirs more than yes, Anon and Zeus. absolutely. Because Amari should have nice things. Amari should. Mm-hmm. Amari is best mm-hmm. girl. She needs to be taken care of. So they they go back to her city. Zane's like, here you. I'm gonna go get Baba. You guys stay here with Mama Agba. And Mommy Agba sees the scroll. She touches it. You find out again. Surprise! Mama Agba was a magi, and she was a. Uh, She's a seer. A seer. That's the term. And she sees a vision of Amari, Zane, and Zaylee trekking up a mountain and she's like you guys are gonna go to the temple in the mountains chandomble i think is what the temple's called the southern air temple (laughs) you need to go you need to go to chandomble and bring magic back to the world it's on you guys i'll take care of your papa once they do get actually to um her fishing village mr zuko inan we have inan's perspective as well he's our third perspective and Again, we'll talk later, but he is the weakest. He just had a tough childhood. His father made him and Amari fight. Like, so Amari, despite being shy, quiet, scared princess, uh, is also an incredible sword fighter because her father has literally been. And and this is why there's going to be a fight scene that happens at the end that is absolutely fantastic and I think built up to built up to beautifully because you have so many scenes where Amari hears her father saying strike Amari and yelling at her and she hears it anytime she's supposed to be doing something that's like intense. Inan and Amari have been pitted against each other for fighting their whole life. Their father's a dick. Inan's not magic though but once he touches that scroll that's when his magic starts. Kaya and his dad just sleep together a lot (laughs) and when Amari runs off with the scroll um, Papa's like, listen, Inan, I need you, Kai, and a couple select people to go. No one must know it's your sister you're chasing, and I need you to get her and bring her back quietly. You're taking Kaya. And Kaya's like, I don't want to go. And he's like, no, Kaya, you gotta go. And so they chase the party to Ilorin. By this point, uh, and and dad's like, burn Ilorin to the ground. And Inan's like, I'm going to attempt not to do that because as much as I need to find my sister and magic is now potentially at risk and that's a bad, I don't want to just murder innocent people. But then like one of his guards accidentally sets the village on fire and he's like, man. That's so silly too. I felt like it should have been a fight between like Kaya and him and Kaya did it. The author wants to keep him a good guy so he can't do anything that breaks the moral event horizon. So it's like, okay, really? A, a guard started the fire? Okay. What I would have liked is if they actually had an altercation where they fought the the other party and then during that something got knocked over and like she sees it happen. The guilt? Yeah. The guilt? Oh my God. Because he's already guilty about the fact that the city got burnt and he was the one in charge, but it would have been great if it would have resulted for something like that but it's not they barely see each other he begins to notice though that like he can't get this girl's face out of his head but he also begins to smell the sea salt and one of his things as a connector is he smells people's auras their souls that kind of thing and he uses that to track zaley he keeps zoning out because his magic is trying to come up and he keeps shoving it down which is painful and not great everyone who gets magic and starts using it is like I can breathe now. So he's literally like semi choking himself all the time. And so what starts to happen is the annoying, uh, enough, where, uh, <laughs> that was good. That was really on point. That's exactly the way the narrator said it in the book. I know I listened to it so many times. Um, and she just like, <laughs> he'll be like, something will be happening in his head. And so this is something, uh, cause Will's about to make a comment about the point of views. Inan's point of view is not very descriptive as far as things are happening around him. He doesn't, there's, you don't get a lot of description about like what things look like. What you do get is whatever is happening in his head. Inan is stuck in his little cranium and the struggle inside himself of like now being magic, hating himself having these the magic intrude upon him and hiding it from kaya which means because a lot of his sections are just him in his head kaya's sitting there like inan we have to go inan in <laughs> and that's kind of funny and it, and it sucks for because like all you get is him having a thought and then him suddenly hearing inan and you know that like kaya's been calling his damn name for like 10 minutes and so like to the reader, Kaya feels annoying, but I actually kind of feel for Kaya yeah, in this know, time because Shane. she's like, what are you well, What are you doing? And she knows something is wrong and she can't figure it out. But again, had their relationship been defined as a positive one, 
Um, Because he says it is. Like, there's a point where he says that he loved her, but you're never really shown that. So the, the gang escapes. They're going up the mountain. You get a great scene from Amari where she's like, once upon a time, I wish I I had wished I could travel the world and see things. And she's like, now that I'm on the side of a mountain, I regret all of that. Binta help. And you get a lot of really good flashbacks in Amari scenes of her relationship with Binta. And it begins to be described more. And I also was like, was it a little romantic? Like the way she describes her love for Binta, I was like, is Amari bi? Was this like kind of romantic? Which I don't know if it was. The novel never lands one way or another. She, Her and Zane have a romance. Oh no, it for sure. Because there's a dancer later, like a sexy dancer that's described from Amari's point of view as really hot. And I'm like, all right, that's what's up. She's definitely bi. I like that, how soft it is. It is. In the I, did, so I thought soft. it was nicely subtle. Yeah. So the thing about Amar, uh, Binta is that originally it didn't feel like she was a real character. But then we get some flashbacks of the two of them interacting. And it's actually really nice. And she starts to feel real. And you start to feel like Amari is a more real character because of it. Mm-hmm. This stands in contrast to Zane and Zeli's mother who like they will not shut up about, but also is not a real character. They don't ever actually have memories of her doing anything with them. There's one part much later in the book where Azeli remembers her mother brushing her hair and doing her hair. And that I thought was nice. There needed to be more of that because the thing is characters are very much defined by their relationships. We're social animals. And so we naturally kind of gel onto like, oh, these two people are interacting a certain way. It feels real, and I kind of get who both characters are. It's just sort of a natural herd animal thing. And their mother not being a real character is, I think, a problem that if she just had a few more tangible memories of, like, tenderness with her mother, I'm talking about Zelly here, I think that would have helped a lot the issue of her and Zane, to me, feeling very shallow and surface level and not really much like real people that wasn't really an issue for you guys but that was an issue for so me. i do agree that i would have liked because when i got to the hair brushing and hair braiding moment and stuff i it was really beautiful and you're right we only see zaylee's mom in bad moments you get the description of her death you get her saving zane and using blood magic to do so a teaching incantation teaching incantations to other reaper diviners and telling the story of the gods to her but it's all has to do with magic the entire it thing and so you don't get as much and i and so i do agree with will like it wasn't a problem for me but I do think once I got that scene of the tenderness and like mom is just mother, like and especially because I would have liked a scene where she thought of mom and Zane, not just like mom. Zane yeah, being, I would have liked not that. Not just Zane being. That's what I was going to say. Passed out and mom using blood magic to save him. But a scene where she saw the tender, like maybe she's sitting in her papa's, her Baba's lap. It's also an issue where the world building and the character are not integrated. You're supposed to, a lot of the ways to sneak in world building into books is through characterization moments, but the scenes with their mother are just world building moments where she's expositing or, or you're learning more about the world. And you're it's right. not like she has a moment where she like yeah. brushes the hair back from Zelly's face and goes like, you know, you're such a brash child, but I love you. Always remember this. There's not like that kind of tenderness to it or her being a real mother or like, God, Zelly, stop asking me questions. I don't care. I'm tired. I need to make this spook. Yeah, exactly. She's not a real character in that way. Yeah, it, exactly that. The thing in this book is that we don't get the focus on, maybe in some, but there are lost things in the focus of the character relationship itself rather than the plot affecting them. What I wanted to say is, again, another nice scene would have been if uh, Zaylee and Zane were actually fighting. And uh, then mom's like, no, 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 no fighting. You always must support each other, Zane. You have to take care of your sister. Yes, because maybe they once upon a time didn't like each other, like because little little sister. And but then when mom dies, then he is like, mom always taught me to look out for Zaylee. I also thought it would be interesting if he threw in her face at some point, like, yeah, I know you're sad about mom, but you didn't really know mom. You were too young to remember anything with her. I love that. I remember her, and that I thought would be like a good way of hanging a lampshade on the problem but also introduce some more real conflict between the two of them and i think it could be interesting for her to think about like like obviously losing your mother is traumatic but i don't remember her as a person and that's sad and so for me one of the issues like because again this wasn't a huge issue for me while i was reading but it was done so well not only with amari and binta's positive relationship because there's a lack of emotionality so zaley has a lot of emotions and reacts emotionally but there's a lack of emotionality in her connections with her 
like parents and her brother that you don't get. So you get yeah. you get several scenes describing the relationship and seeing the relationship between Binta and her. Uh, and you also get the negative side of that with her and her father. It's really well, like, it so is. So, it's so, it's the strongest part. By the time you get to the scene that I'm going to talk about at the end, it has been laid out and you're missing those emotional beats for Zaylee. It's there. The death of her mother is there, but because we don't have that a positive emotional, because like Amari's shitty relationship with her, her father is really well contrasted against her positive relationship with Binta. And so her mother's, death and the negative thing associated with her mother's death would have been really better served to have the positive like to see the yeah. tenderness and positiveness and again as a reader this didn't like while I was reading the book bother me but in retrospect it could have been done better by the time I got to Amari's finale scene I was so invested yes that was the best part and it was only because there's something that happens right before the end again you get the hair description with her mother that a scene finally at the end gave me that same sort of emotionality not as much as the scene with Amari but we'll and we'll get to that and I think had it been started from the beginning as Will said it would have worked better so they go to the mountain <laughs> they go to the mountain village or the, the mountain temple, Chandomble, and while they're there, they find there's like they're walking through and it's all just like there's skulls everywhere, bones, the the building's been blown up. They don't find a flying rat squirrel, but no, they do not. Uh, Zaylee no also has begun to actually manifest her powers at this point because all the death that happened there, she's like reading into and it, she she's seeing it. like spirits, yeah, and then. They meet Lacan, and Lacan is the last of the. It starts with the C. It sounds like centaurs, but they're not actually centaurs. It starts it's with like the centauri or something. Uh, like centauri, that. yeah. It's the centauri. So he's the last of the centauri, and what the centauri were were the connection between the gods and the rest of magic users. They were that like connection point so what you find out is the reason magic's gone is because once upon a time evil king P P papa batty decided to visit this temple and he learned that there was a ceremony and some sacred objects that if you put it all together and you did this ceremony on this island it reaffirmed and it has to happen every 100 years it reaffirmed the connection to sky mother because like all these gods are sky mother's children you have to reconnect to the gods and sky mother's children or to sky mother and the scroll gave Gives you like a baby connection but the actual whole world connection to the gods and sky mother has been broken because papa batty got all the sacred objects and destroyed them no he tried to destroy them couldn't hid them and he murdered what he thinks is all the centauri so that way nobody could do and the what was the mama legba uh, mama thing? lao mama lao uh, is a female and a female must do the ritual this is a good time for me to talk about how generic i feel the world is first off the magic system i felt was very generic in terms of like one of the things that works about Avatar The Last Airbender is that they tie the magic into the Kung Fu system, and that gives it a yeah. lot of vitality and concreteness. And it's like, I remember after watching Avatar, I watched some anime where they also, also had like elemental powers, and it just felt so unkinetic and boring that you could just yeah. like shoot a fireball, and that's not as cool as an Avatar. And so for me, this magic system felt, it's fairly standard. It's just elemental magic, and that's not really distinctive. Now, the books get a lot of accolades for being like, having such a distinctive setting. I feel that a lot of that just comes from being in an African setting. And there is a lot of description of food and clothing and all the names are very African, but it's all skin deep. Their culture is not specific to anything. <laughs> you could change the names and change kaftan to tunic and it would basically still work. You could change the names to European, it would be mostly the same. You could change them to Asian and it would be mostly the same. What are the cultural taboos? What are their cultural beliefs? What are their actual religious beliefs like? None of these things are actually in there. And the magic system isn't integrated into the world. They just like have mages and their mages are just like around. It's not a system where it really changes that much about it. I'll say two small things. One, they do discuss the clans and how they came to the summit of, you know, where all the Centauri are and how they like had a social system and everything. The other thing is, I wouldn't say it's skin deep. You're right. It could have like the, the whole idea that the king says gods aren't real and now everybody believes that. Then what do they believe in? That's fair. And that's actually kind of maybe important. It really is. I would have liked it if there'd been more examination of like when the king says the gods aren't real, like yes. what do they replace? 
replace that with? That would have made it feel like a little- The gods are dead. Yes, but then what happened after? Do they have a Stalinistic like state ideology? Is there a vague sense of the gods? That's what it felt like to me. It felt like uh, a, it felt uh, almost fascistic. Like like this is- No. The government is the, the power point. That's never, no one says that. No one thinks that we're never shown that. Like I would have preferred that, but I would not say it's skin deep. I think she really tried to put heart and soul in this. And I think it is somewhat successful. And also the magic system is based on an actual African religion, like the Orisha, the different gods, all of that. So like, I understand, like, if you don't have that information, yeah, it just feel, but like different cultures have things that feel really similar across them. And so for me, I don't have this issue I, I liked the world. I liked the description. I liked these African animals that got fantasyified, just like Western animals have been fantasy. Like, it was like He Man. A lionar is like so. I, I don't. I don't have- yes, Will. It is formulaic, but it's fantasy. But it's fantasy set in another. Co- I, I I don't. I can't think of any fan like Western classic Western fantasy things. It's just Western fantasy. It's why we default to thinking of fantasy as Western, but it's not deep. What is it? The stories don't have to be deep to be what they are. Yeah, like people- Oh, oh okay, so two two things I want to point out because I realize I didn't say this. A, I am not trying to make an attempt to say you have to be African in a certain way. If you want to write just a skin deep, because there are plenty of skin deep European fantasy stories, that's fine. I'm not saying because the author is black, she needs to write African in a certain way. That's not my place to say. So I do want to- just foreground that. I do think though that there is a complete lack of world building here. Well, okay, not a complete lack, but again, there are no social taboos. We don't really get a strong sense of their cultural beliefs beyond there are some elemental gods. And sure, that is a real thing, but just because it's a real thing doesn't mean it's inventive or new or cool. And again, the magic is not does not actually change their society. The magic is just kind of put on top of it. And again, there are, like Maria said, there are lots of fantasy books that do that. I don't think that that makes this setting interesting or really unique beyond everything is African. But see, I think the magic is so integral to the social issues of this book. I don't understand that comment at all. There literally was magic. It was integrated into society in in meaningful ways. Somebody literally got rid of it and now certain people have it. So yeah, it feels like it's on top of it, but that's because that's a I think a product of this plot and the situation. This reminds me of African Americans detachment from their African heritage and history and cultural things. That's what it felt like to me. It felt like they were trying to rediscover something that had been taken from them forcibly by another group of people. And that's beautiful. And that's how I took it. So again, for me, I didn't mind that. This is the like this is the author's struggle to try reconnect that her characters having that same struggle trying to reconnect. I think that would be really interesting. But the problem is that they are not reconnecting back to anything because she didn't do the world building to say that. Yes. So I will agree it needed more cultural, like, because what Will set up is we don't have like cultural taboos. So like, perhaps you don't walk barefoot over a certain like, like you, when you cross a threshold, you do a certain thing. There are those things that are missing. And could it have made the story stronger? Yes but it didn't make the story weaker for me. Yeah, exactly. Could it have been? Yeah, but it didn't make it a weak story. And the thing is, I didn't look at this and say, ah, this had shit world building. It did the world building it wanted to do. And again, could it have been better? And there are going to be comments I make like this as well. Absolutely. But I don't think it makes it shitty world building. I think that it makes it very shallow world building. You know, in Star Wars, for example, they don't really play into how does the Force change the universe? How does star fighting change because of, it's basically just dog fights in space. In sci-fi, you change an element and then you track how that changes society and the world and the setting. And often in fantasy, you do the same thing. Not in all fantasy, but in some. And generally that's more of a thing now. I think it's necessary in a world where there is a lot of magic. And in this world, there used to be a lot of magic. So were there tribes that only survived in the desert because they had like a water whatever person? Are there island cities because those were where the dirt people could like create islands out of the ground? Did mages get to have more wives because then it gives them a better chance of spawning more mage offspring? Is it a situation where like they were much more egalitarian than they are now because they didn't really care about bloodline ties? It was really about whether your kid was a mage or not. There's a lot of really interesting, distinctive things that you can do. And this book 
really doesn't do that. It just puts magic over a normal setting. Fair point as well, honestly. Yeah, yeah. No, I'll, I'll give you that. Again, I didn't think it needed it. Like, could it could it have been better? Yes. I think for a first novel, this is pretty good. All right. Uh, where were we with the plot? They're at the temple. Lacan is like, we need to turn you into the Mama Lao because I can't do the ceremony that's going to do this thing. It has to be a woman to connect to Sky Mother. So I'm going to turn you into the Mama Lao. And here's something that I do wish they would have done because Amari like is there and she's doing things. I really would have liked Amari to have a, a bit more of a purpose or stake in what's happening. Without it, she's still a great character. But I kind of wish that like whoever the Centauri or the Mama Lao were, they weren't actually mad, mad, magi. They, they were given a connection and they were just like the connectors. They weren't magi. Um, and so I would have liked it if Amari actually had to have been the Mama Lao. And that was her, her skin in the game was that she had to be the one to do this connection. So you had like Zaylee as the the Magi who's gonna have to fight and like do the things and like who's the spearhead of the like revolution. And then you had Amari in the background who suddenly has to be the connector and she has to be the one to bring magic back despite her upbringing. Again, Amari's still a great character. Would it have been better? Yes, I think, but it didn't like, weaken it again Amari could have used a little bit more at this point we're getting a little bit of romance a little bit more romance from Zane and Amari but I just wanted to point out we don't really get a personality from Zane honestly we just know he's the older brother he's protective type. older brother that's and and he plays a sport that's something where I do think Zane is a weaker character his emotional beats don't hit because he doesn't have as much of a personality as he could. Especially because, like, his sister, I mean, again, it's not the most unique personality, but you got good heart, brash, headstrong, and then Zane's just, like, a protect. Anon comes, he, he catches up to them, he, he's like a, a hound dog, scenting Zaylee's sea salt smell through, no, okay, through the, just... the mountains, which is, like, Will, I agree with Will, this is ridiculous. It, the way it was described, like, literally, like, he sees blue plumes, and then he smells it, and he's, like, hound dogging, hunting her through the, it, it, it does. He's smelling her spiritual farts. Yeah, that's what, that's the vibe it gives you, and so. I know, I know. This was something that felt very new author to me, where, like, we couldn't have described this in a better, there wasn't a better way to do this, guys, like. Like, anyway, he follows the spiritual farts. <laughs> How long do they last? How long do these spiritual farts hang in the air? Yeah, good point. Like, are some stronger than others? Are some more silent and they go away quicker? And also, why doesn't he smell his sister? Is it only Matt? I know. I was wondering, I was wondering the same thing the like entire a, time. That to me is why it felt like such a, uh, a, a romancy trope of insta-love. And that's why I would have liked for Zane, Amari, and... Because it does, Will's right, uh, it, 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 the book tries to explain it as not insta-love, but it does come across as insta-love because she's the only, the only other person he smells is Kaya. Yes, yeah. wouldn't it have been so cool if actually, like, he got a weird mirrored effect because of the thought thing and emotion thing, and each time he came across their grouping of spiritual farts, he, um, <laughs> noticed, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, that's ruining it. Anyway, he noticed the, the change in their teamwork. That's how he kind of learns the subtler feelings of things along with reading other villagers and stuff. stuff. But wouldn't that have been kind of fun, like, where he's, like, getting flashes of, like, I don't know, their memories or something, and then he's, like, oh, wow, like, this is, and then he, he learns more about Amari, like he does at one point, and he sees her, how happy she becomes, and then how magic is actually, in a weird way, having a positive effect. Again, if his powers had had him interact with anyone besides Kaya and Zaylee, it, it would have been nice. Anyway, he followed the spiritual farts of Zaylee. He gets to the mountain. They, they, they do the fight. They cross a bridge. Lacan's like, throws the lepinars, which are the leopard giant righty creatures, into a thing. In honor, Kaya ends up killing him, but he does it so that the others can cross, a, like get across this bridge and then he cuts the bridge. Kaya kills him in the back with a dagger, I think, or something. And Zaylee's like, no, and she gets a flood of Lacan's memories. And this was actually a nice moment that I would have like, I would have liked highlighted more. Once he dies, Zaylee and Inan get glimpses into his life. She experiences when people die, some of their memories and like their thoughts as they were dying. And he 
can just, like, Lacan left some spiritual farts lying around. He has some emotional flashbacks to Lacan. And it would have been nice if this was, like, brought up at all that they both had this intimate moment, like, and that their powers both have them share. Except, yeah, that's actually a cool point. He gets to share in the livings emotional intimate moments and she only gets to share in the deads oh my god that's such a stellar point a yin and yang and it just isn't highlighted as much as it because it's there and that would have been a great way for them to bond like it's exhausting just having people's thoughts in your head like what a good way to actually set up a romance (laughs) inan has this ability to like draw in people or go into their minds and like go into this cool dreamscape that's where they fight and most of their relationship lies in the beginning because he's like you cursed me you did this and she's like bitch that ain't my magic that's yours um and and katie is right the dreamscapes weren't and he's able to like summon people there the only person he summons again is zaley <laughs> why wouldn't he go to amari amari thank you thank you like go to bed being like man i just wish i could talk to amari and see what's happening and then boom so um off they go and they're running away from inan and inan is there trying to investigate with his powers but he's trying to hide from kaya about this so he's like kaya do this ridiculous thing where we build a bridge and that's how we're gonna get across that was absurd that would eat up so much time and he's like yeah but you know and he starts reading a lot of memories he's learning a little bit more about magic and meanwhile amari and the group are do you like how i focused on amari and not zaley anyway amari and the group they go off into the desert it's because they're trying to find the next two pieces and um they were hinted One piece, at they already have the other two that's right right, right they lose the so dagger they... but then they get it back kaya finds inan looking at magic doing magic stuff so they have a scuffle and she dies and he kind of kills her or kind of doesn't it's like a little ambiguous accidentally but he did it yeah and so in the desert the three amigos they find a big coliseum where there's a bunch of fights where the it's tr- it, like they find a bunch of like ships having a fight in water coliseum style. Yeah, but in a desert, we're in a desert where there is no water. Yeah. Where so, but this is in the coliseum. But why, out of all the fights, water? Uh, why pu- ships? That seems so. How do they fit it? Like, how do they the wreckages? And there's literally a part where she's on a boat later that fits a dozen people plus her crew and a couple other people. So at least like 20 people on a boat. And she's like, it's not as big as the the ships that we fought within the Coliseum. And this is, again, just a weird choice because it's a giant Coliseum and then it fills with water. Tunnels open. You hear this rushing water. Again and again and again. Number one, where does the water go? Does it leak through the sand a little bit every time? Are you losing water? Because what it is, is this is rich people betting on poor people dying. It's one of those moments because it's a bunch of diviners that have to man the boats. And then it's like some rich non-diviners who get to be the captain. Because the idea is if you win, you get a pile of gold and you get this... S- magic stone that they don't know is the sunstone but they think it's magic and it it surprises it's the sunstone so they have to join this weird tournament to get the sunstone and what you learn is nobody has survived everyone always dies everyone bombs themselves to shit and so you set up this really impossible and this is one of and i said i would talk about the coliseum scene you set up this impossible like nobody lives nobody lives everyone dies nobody's ever won this thing and it just feels real weird that your protagonists roll up they're the heroes but it's so absurd like we're gonna have a boat (laughs) battle but also the entire situation in the city is it stands out so uncomfortably it's the one thing where if i could have been like this is actually damaging your books pace and everything it's the one thing and also because you can have them find the stone a different way but nothing in this section of the story besides getting the stone impacts the rest of the plot it's a filler episode it is a filler episode this is this is the part where i once we finish this part i stop thinking of this as avatar in africa i did too actually this is more or less at the point where i was like okay this book is gaining its own identity but after this because this feels like a weird filler episode it's weirdly episodic in a story that's otherwise not episodic it's a fetch quest yeah oh yeah exactly it's a fetch quest which you get in avatar they have fetch quests and so you also get like the fetch quest and then the the deadline we have to do this thing by the solstice which also felt when it was first set up very avatar after this point again it gets its legs it feels a bit like its own thing this is just a bizarre scene again i think something else should have been done with it if it had been just a normal coliseum fight in the desert 
I think it would have worked better. It also is like a little bit weird that like this is the prize they need and this is the prize they're giving this one to like, how has nobody won this prize before? Exactly. Are they just doing it now? Like it's a little bit like, man, that doesn't quite play correctly. It would have been much cooler if they had for some reason gotten thrown into pits with giant sand scorpions. Yeah. Oh, that would have been so much dude, cooler. that would have been so cool. You know what also completely took me out of it was the announcer's voice. It's because he sounds like an episode episode version of like like that's what would be an avatar he would have a he had like an almost like an American not American but like welcome ladies and gentlemen yeah, it's oddly modern it sounded like WWE yeah. it was like that yes. episode with Toph where there's the <laughs> The earth bending oh, yeah. WWE. It was that vibe. So it's just weird. I think there should have been another way to find the sunstone. This is the, a huge thing for me that did not. There's a bunch of little things that don't work that you can nitpick. This for me was a huge thing that did not work. So they they battle Royale. Uh, it is during this part that Zaylee learns how to use one of the things her mother did quite frequently, which was to take spirits of the dead and make apparitions that could affect things in like the actual world. And so she makes ghost armies. It's like in Lord of the Rings where there's that ghost yeah, army where they come, they do the thing and then they leave. Uh, she struggles, she can't get it at first. Eventually she gets it, we move on. They get the sunstone and now they're like, okay, we've got to go. And then they have a moment where they're like, oh man, things have calmed down. Let's play in a river. And then Inan comes. I know this scene is literally exactly like, you know, the guy with the third eye when he, yeah, with the side thing. Boom, boom, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I remember, I remember Sokka. This book could have used just Sokka. Yeah, they're literally playing in water the same way, I think. Uh, Inan comes up and it's weird because at this point, like Inan killed Kaya, but he still had a bunch of other people who were with him, but now he's alone. And it's never explained. And this was a weird thing where I was like, this, and I thought it was going to connect to something that happens later, where he does something and like a bunch of people attack and you're like, oh, he just left them behind him a little bit and let that, no. He's alone. He just shows up alone. Him and Zaylee start battling it out. Uh, and while they're battling it out, Zayn and Amari get taken by these masked people and whisked away. And eventually Zaylee hears, uh, or Anon or Zaylee hear Amari screaming and they're like, oh shit, our siblings have been kidnapped. And during this moment, he touches her or something happens and he sees a glimpse of her childhood and trauma. And he sees her mom dying and he's like, and again, this was too fast. As a reader, while I was reading it, it was fine. It happened. I went through it. This would be a place where I'd say, this is a mediocre portrayal of what this author was trying to do. And it could have been excellent. Oh, that's a beautiful way of saying that. A mediocre portrayal of what the author intended. Which is fine. Mediocre. It does the job. It did what she wanted it to do. But it is a mediocre portrayal. He, he's suddenly now a good guy. I find Inan's character to be very unconvincing. So the thing about it is that ideologically speaking, it kind of makes sense that Amari is less brainwashed because she had Binta and that kind of a thing. Inan does not seem to really have believed any of the propaganda that his father has been telling him all his life, that Magi are dangerous, that they are inherently dangerous, that you can't trust them, that they will use their power for bad, all these things that his father has said and he should believe and really should be like, state propaganda he just kind of doesn't think is real he immediately even once he decides he turns to good he doesn't keep thinking of the magi in a dangerous way and it's odd because later on he'll then relapse into thinking that way but by that point you're like okay but why didn't you believe this to begin with the the progression here is not super clear one of the things that avatar understood is that it took three seasons to get Zuko to the good side. You had to deal with the ideological beliefs he had as a Fire Nation person and the personal uh, problems he had with his family and his father. And each of those had to kind of be dealt with a little bit separately. This book tends to confuse the two. And part of the problem is that I think because the author was so invested in this as a response to the very unjustified killings happening in our country, that there is no real... The king is like genocidal and bad completely. There is supposed to be no validity to his reign or his beliefs. And that's not quite borne out by the world building. And I feel like there would be a much better conflict if there was more of a push and pull between 
how dangerous the Magi are, should people be exceptional in that way. And we'll talk about this more later because some other stuff happens and the book complicates it a little bit. But in general, I just feel like Inan should have had more ideology to overcome. He just seems to be like, oh, this girl is hot. Oh, there's some tragic stuff that happened. Magi are good now. I agree and don't agree. So I feel like he makes a personal, like he can, it's like if you have a racist person and they, they meet like a couple awesome people and they're like, these people aren't like that, but they still have the general. Cause I never felt yeah. like he lost the idea. He always seemed afraid of magic. Yeah, I agree. He hated himself for magic. He was like semi okay with Zaley's, but like he sees, like he, he decides he's going to help Zaley. So this is what happens. He decides he's going to help Zaley free his sister and Zane. Um, he hasn't like fully bought into their plan, but he's like, we shall work together. And you could have played this really well as like, he's not on their side. And this isn't what the author does. And we'll talk about it a little bit where like he helps them escape, tries to grab Imari and like betrays them immediately. That's not what happens because through trying to help uh, rescue them. He he learns more about her, and he always has had an issue with the way his father approached things. He was team. If magic is so powerful, it's going to hurt people. Then yeah, it probably shouldn't exist. But we shouldn't be bitches to the diviners. That's the vibe I got from Anon from the beginning. He 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 thought his dad's subjugation and like meanness to the diviners was unfairly harsh. Was unfairly harsh. But he was always kind of like, mm, I don't think magic sounds like a good idea. And so he he talks to Zaley and be, and he sees. He's, he the first time he sees the actual manifestation of his father being a dick to people and he turns like he and, and again this was too quick it needed time it needed some stuff but he, he he's in love with Zaley he sees her pain and he's like that doth suck and then he sees like there's this whole village of people because Zane and Amari were taken by a village of diviners slash magi who had originally found the scroll well so the book also does an unfortunate thing to hurt its own world building that it doesn't need to do which is that the author didn't realize that the quest to make magic come back undercuts a lot of what she's trying to say about genocide of um, marginalized people. Because usually, like in Hogwarts, if you want to get rid of magic, you have to kill all the magic users. And obviously, that's not okay. In this world, though, what his father is doing is not actually necessary because they have a mechanism for just getting rid of magic. Later, when he's like, let's bring magic back, that doesn't really make sense if he still thinks of magi as dangerous and not something to be fear. See, I never thought he was on board for bringing magic back. It never it never felt to me. But he does later when he's he's talking to Zelly about like, hey, why don't we slowly integrate them? Oh, see, for well, me, he's thinking more positively, but then it really cuts down when he sees the violence of it. Well, so yeah, me, it changes. For me, it was a matter of like, like he was looking at these people, this, this like town of people and like, you know, they could be useful. He's like, how much better would like public works be if we had like welders and like rock movers? And so he approaches it from a like, like as a ruler, how could I make magic integrate and work better in society? And he has this for a brief moment. And this is why I'm okay with it because he very quickly defaults because like he sees a burner and, and Zaley also has a little bit of this as well. There's a burner in this village that when they try to go save their siblings, the burner nearly nukes Zaley. Uh, and Inan jumps in front of her because again, is in love. Zayla begins to get a bit scared of just putting magic in the hands of anyone because just like humans, you don't know it's a left a box of chocolate, you don't know what you're going to get. Same with magic users. What if somebody uses like intense powers to be a real dick? It's literally like just giving everyone like arsenal of weapons and being like I hope everyone uses this for good. Which by the way, we live in America so we understand how much of a problem that is. That's such a gentle way and an understatement of how severe. But no. what I wanted to say is, yeah, there's no more structure. There's no more clanage. It's because they killed all the magic users. So there's no more elders to teach or control. So yeah, that's actually a really, I liked that. Yeah. And because she thinks about that. She's like, we've lost the, like, there's no older people where if somebody decides to become a like homicidal magic user, like to be able to deal with that. But anyway, so it's, they both have this moment of being like, ah, ma maybe magic's a little scary. And then the outcome of it of Z is Zaley eventually like later when the fire nation attacks and this is when i thought because like suddenly like in the middle of a party because every like eventually the village of diviners are like oh no actually you have some diviners and you weren't trying to subjugate us and steal our scroll we'll all be friends and they have a party and in the middle of the party and during this party zaley and anon get hot and heavy zaley is like 
we can't do this, but I want to do it. And Anand's like, I want to do it. Who says we can't? And this is where he hatches his plan for like what Orisha would look like if he was king. Because at this point, he he, lo- he likes Ailey. He wants to make her happy. And he sees that magic could be a good force. Here, let me pose a question to you guys. Okay. Yeah. Let's say Hitler had a son. Right. Would you be into dating him after he burned down your village? Katie, you first. I honestly, I... I don't understand that whatsoever. There's literally absolutely no way unless in the dreamscape they shared memories and empathized with one another. And that's how that built it. It's because that that way she learns that he didn't actually set fire to the village. Maria, young Mr. Mr. Hitler Jr. Jr. Yes. How hot would he have to be for you to want to date him? I don't know if hotness would come into play for me. (laughs) And I think Katie's right. Utilizing the dream, because they have argued and been at each other's throats for most of this. It's it's only in this, like they start like being like, oh, we don't have to. And and I think I would have preferred if there just wasn't a romance between them. I'm okay if they could have been like friends and and learn to trust each other. And like, we've got to like, Orisha needs to come together to heal this, like we need to restore balance. And this is just one of those things where like, if you were gonna have a romance between these two characters, I think it would have worked way, way, way better down the line. I, I thought about that because I knew this book was gonna do this. And I remember saying to Will like, eh, I don't want it to happen that soon. As I was reading it, it was fine. Like it, the book does, it, this is what they wanted. And I understand why, because he's gonna switch back to the other side by the end. But it just, I think if they'd just been friends and not romantically involved at this part, it would have done the exact same thing as far as the plot. Like they, they, the plot could have been exactly the same without- It's too fast. Like you're saying, the plot doesn't need them to be super close or making fit like kissy faces at each they other. They just need to trust each other. Because he, when when he does the thing, she's like, he has betrayed my trust. So uh, the final attacks the village and she's that's a good fourth reference to that but uh, it's, it's it, very it, similar this was the one place when when they attacked in my head as i was reading it i went to the fire nation attacked this was the one place where i felt because it was literally an army of people where it, everywhere else it's just been a couple of guards you haven't felt like fire nation-y they attack and at this point zaley is watching like there's this nice healer girl she gets slaughtered um and she's watching like the diviners who don't have magic are just getting brutalized and the only thing that ends up saving some of them is uh the burner whose name i forgot he uses blood magic and he just burns him like he burns up like he's a wick and he just foof and zane watches this or not zane uh inan watches this and is like oh man one person just took out three platoons. This is not, that is too much. That is OP. Nope, I'm not here for this, but I gotta save Zaley. Um, And so she wakes up, she's been captured. And I thought this was gonna be the moment where you find out that Anand hadn't actually left all his people. He just told them to follow behind them and he was going oh. to have made like, and this was like- That would have been so good. Again, if you just slow down some of that, again, this didn't need to be romantic right now. Uh, because Zaley, this is, again, they were both both kind of scared of magic. Zaley's like, I don't know if this is the right decision. And she watches them attack and then watches this burner save a bunch of people at the expense of himself. And she's like, the only way we are going to be able to survive is if we have power. And right now we have none. And he looks at it and he's like, that's too much power. They have this schism of like ideologies. And so he's kind of back on it, but he's still trying to save Zaley because he doesn't think he deserves, she deserves the fate that his father's going to give on her. So he's pretending, he was like, ah, oh, yes, I, I was there. I led you to them and and uh Zaley wakes up initially and he's like you betrayer and then he's like no 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 once they're all gone he's like I need you to tell me how to get rid of the thing because that's the only way I'm gonna save you I need to get rid of that scroll magic is dangerous and she's like ah, I knew it but they still kind of love each other and then Amari and Zane are like we must save our siblings so it's literally like save siblings and then now reverse save siblings they they end up finding some uh diviners who were part of the sport that Zane played and they were like we shall give you magic help us save our siblings and then we'll bring magic back to everyone so they amass their army and while they're breaking in Anon has a conversation with his dad where he realizes his dad is never gonna let Zaley live he 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 keeps trying to be diplomatic with his dad being like well what if we used her as a diplomat to make other people listen to it and his dad's like no 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 son you don't work with them my father tried to make life better for the magi and then they murdered him and my entire family you give them nothing and he's like man papa is not going to listen so he's like i just have to break her out so he goes to grab uh Zaley. and at this point 
She has been tortured. Literally, they carved the word maggot into her back and they put this, I think it's magicite, like liquid magicite. They never tell you, Mm -hmm. but they cut uh, into her neck and pour this. (gasps) Oh, yeah. That's what happens in Korra. Yeah, it was really shit. Um, and they pour this thing into her neck and it like subdues her abilities. He ends up saving her. She's she's not doing great. Uh, as he's going up to get her out, uh, Amari and Zane come and Amari is like kicking butt. So Amari has had this problem where she can never actually like use the sword. She knows how to, she's good at it. The first time she does is doing the Colosseum bit and they're like, she's the lion arm. And she's like, I'm not, I'm not guys. And then as she's going in to break into this prison to save them, she's like, I gotta do it. I gotta, I gotta try channel the lion or energy. And again, her dad is in her head being like, strike Amari. And she, she gets to this point where like her father is running and like, she needs to go down this hall and she's like, I'm gonna kill him. I'm gonna kill daddy. And then she's like, no, 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 bad priorities. I gotta, I gotta go save him. So they end up getting Zaley. They have two days to get to the island place. Uh, they end up getting some mercenaries to help them. Zaley can't use her magic. She doesn't have it. And then they end up getting to the island and she's gonna do, like, she ends up telling Amari, like, hey, I don't have magic, but I've got to trust that the gods know what they're doing at this point. And they get there and they think everything is going good, but surprise, Saron, who's evil Papa Daddy King, uh, and in honor there with a bunch of people who have been hiding, waiting for them to come. And they also have Zane and Zaylee's dad. And they're like, stop or what kill him. And Zaylee's like, I don't even have magic anyway. I'm not gonna let them kill my dad. Here, take everything. But then they end up killing her dad anyway. Surprise. Cause like they, they send an arrow and dad jumps in front of it. Um, and this was one of those moments where like, cause had they played her relationship with his dad, her dad, right? It could have played like in um, Pyotr Vladim- Vladimirovich. His his sacrifice as a papa, uh, it could have had that emotional weight to it, but it doesn't because we haven't gotten enough interactions with her and her dad to make him a real character that we mourn. It's similar to like Will said, where like we care a lot about animals, like Nyla nearly gets killed at one point, And I was like, no, no. I know. I know. No. I was so concerned. So Enon also had a, a, a lepe- leopard, uh, a female leopard. So it was really cute. And she gets impaled and I like died. I was like, why is he ever going to forgive them for this? Yeah. I was like, yeah, no, I this know. is a moral event horizon. He's not coming back from this. And then he just forgets yeah, about he it. He forgets it. So had the relationship with her dad been a little different it could have played more but anyway his his sacrifice and she's covered in his blood like awakens her magic again and it's blood magic is super powerful and it doesn't need that incantation so she's just like nuking people left and right and Anon's like man I gotta destroy this scroll because he's got it and he tries to use his magic the only way to destroy the scroll to keep any of this from happening is to use magic, but his magic can't do that. The way he kills people is by like literally getting into their mind and stopping them from breathing. <laughs> he forced them. You can't do that to a scroll. So he's like, I'm, and this was such a dick move. And this is why if they had just been friends and it hadn't been romantic, this could have had such cool impact. He uses her grief to get her to destroy it herself. Like he's, he like goads her and then she like sends a dead arrow person at him and it destroys the scroll and it disintegrates and she's like no and then papa baddie is like look my son you did it yay you finally made me proud after all of these and then somebody goes to kill papa daddy and he's like no papa daddy and he uses his magic to save his father but then his father is like no you maggot and then kills him and then literally impales it on and and meanwhile amari's fighting and she's being real badass like and it's such a cool moment because she hears her father like strike and then she's striking and it's all this thing and then she turns and her father has killed Inon, and she's like oh no her greatest fear has been her father and they have this like clash and it's great because like the person telling her to strike in her head is her father who she's striking again this is the most this is the best character this is the best character it's the best fight scene in the whole dang book because you really feel and then at one point she almost kills him and she stops herself she's like i can't be like him this is i'm literally listening i need to be better literally listening to the voice in my head that is him telling me to kill like this is not productive uh and she goes to not do it but then he ends up almost killing her and she ends up killing him in self-defense at that point uh and she literally i think she says something like i don't worry i'll be a better queen no 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 it's he he always told her this is gonna make you a better queen. It's because of all the suffering she had to go through. And so no, she- No, 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 that's what he told An- uh, Anon because she was never supposed to be a queen. This will be- make you a better whatever mm-hmm. then. But like, that's how she mimics it back to it. 
And then says queen. She kills him. And then meanwhile, Thaley is like with the scroll, like what, what do I do? Like, holy, I, I can't, I don't remember the incantation. I can't do it. The solstice is starting. This is the moment. And she ends up doing this thing. And it would have been really cool if playing with ancestors had been brought up earlier. And this is way where I think Will's critique that perhaps if the world building had been different and like ancestor worship had been a little bit more at the forefront, it could have played really cool with this. Like, like maybe instead of worshiping gods, everybody turned to worshiping their ancestors oh that would children of blood and bone that because she ends up realizing like i am literally channeling the blood of my father my mother's blood maybe if i go far back enough as a reaper i can access this ritual from someone and she ends up doing that and she creates the connection that's such a good point oh my god yeah she ends up creating the connection by literally going back in her timeline to her first ancestor who made the connection with uh the gods and so it's such an interesting thing but it comes out of nowhere in this moment that you really like eh. and so i i need to mention a scene because we're gonna get an emotional scene with Zaley where that is the one that actually like hit me a little bit but it's because of like the night before all this goes down Amari's brushing her hair and it's that moment where Zaylee thinks about her mother brushing her hair like her mother used to have to hold her down without apparitions to get her to like sit still Zaylee when she goes back in time with the blood magic and accesses her ancestors through her blood she ends up dying because blood magic is really dangerous and once she switches from using her dad's blood to using her own congratulations you did and she goes into the death world and she hears like there's the the song that has been sung a couple times in the book she hears it being sung and she realizes like oh i'm in the peaceful blackness of death and then a figure appears before her and she thinks it's going to be oya who's her goddess, the the reaper goddess. And she sees it appearing, but then it ends up having the face of her mother. And her mom is talking to her like, good job, you did a good thing. But it, like this emotional, and it's only because of that scene with the hair brushing that this affected me at all as a cute scene. Um, and she basically talks with her mom and her mom's like, no, 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 you gotta go back. You got stuff to do, girl. Your job ain't done. She wakes up and she's like, did it work, guys? And Zane and Amari are there. And at first she's like, oh God, it didn't work. And then Amari holds up her hand. And now she has magic and she's got ice magic. So that's how the book ends. I'm interested to see where this goes. I'm interested to see the world with magic. But again, the emotional beats with her mother in this scene could have been so much better had it, the relationship been established more. Okay, so I have two issues that I wasn't, I, we didn't get a chance to bring up. And one of them is A, important to the book and the other is important to why I'm leaving YA behind. So the first is that I felt that the three viewpoints were very indistinct from each other. All of them think the same way. One of the things we'll talk about in a video coming up uh, in Hyperion is how that book uses the different viewpoints to tell very different stories. In this one, everybody has the same kind of thoughts and the same mental, uh, some mental process. Same mental uh, tone, cadence. The cadence was the same. And I didn't understand what was happening because also the book felt very blunt to me in terms of characters just saying what they were thinking or feeling or very unsubtle. Um, and then I was reading some reviews of it and somebody quoted a passage, they put a screenshot of it. And I realized that the thing about it is that the characters tend to think a lot in a paragraph of thought, a sentence of thought for emphasis, then a line break and another sentence, and then another line break in the same sentence with thought differently. Like it's very staccato. Yeah. And not that that isn't effective, but it's kind of dramatic and all of the characters do this. So they all have to think the same way and they all have to think in that kind of blunt declarative statement way about their emotions and the thing about it is as i was going through it i was like this is so blunt and obvious and then i'm like but that's okay for a ya book like you're talking to teenagers who don't necessarily so it's one of these things where if you're talking to a teenager then like yeah they're not going to necessarily be able to pick on pick up on a lot of subtlety in the thought process and so and i realized that this has been a problem in dustborn and iron widow and not so much the wrath of the dawn but kind of and so, like, I think I can't keep going to Little League games and being disappointed that the kids aren't very good at the game. Like, so there's an extent to which this is okay for YA, but it's not something I really want to read. And mostly what will happen is I'll just keep complaining about books and annoying Maria. Like, that's really the, all that will happen is if I keep reading YA books. I'll be disappointed. I'll tear them to shreds. And Maria will be like, but why are you going to the Little League game? I don't think it totally lacks individual tone, but you are right. It The problem is, is the writing style doesn't change. And since it's like from their limited point of view, it should change. And the styles should reflect their own there's nothing that stands out to me that shows a difference in thoughts or feelings as far as like their the actual writing 
goes. See, I disagree a little bit. I, I think maybe it's how I interacted with it. And Katie, you have to tell me as someone who read it. For me, when I was in Amari's point of view, it didn't feel as blunt. She was an observer. She just no, I agree. the world around I her. I agree. And her narration for me, and part of this is the voice actress, but I also just like what was being said was softer with a softer like and and she just she observed things she watched things the descriptions in her point of view were always more vivid than in Zaylee's or in Non's. Inan was stuck in his own head so all of his thoughts were like these like blunt and so him Inan and Zaylee, fair enough that's personality true. wise are very blunt and so I will agree that Zaylee and Inan as far as how they thought and their thought process was very dramatic and very blunt Amari's wasn't and it might just be no I agree like the writer was like oh they are very headstrong characters and this is how they do it because I will say that those two are more similar and Nons for me lacked because Zaylee would give you some description and she wasn't just stuck in her head I would rate Amari Zaylee and then Anon because Anon literally was not looking at what was happening around him he he focused on individual characters but you didn't get descriptions of setting you didn't get that other stuff now as far as his thought process I will agree with Will that his thought process and Zaylee's thought process were very similar I would say that Amari's was different the way I yes what that's why I love her every time she thought about something she associated a memory with it like she was processing things through memories and yes. Zaylee and Anon were not they were processing it as the world was like as it just happened we didn't get to have the emotional bond of like her personality blooming through the exactly. moments exactly and so I will agree with that with in again Anon's for me like I knew which chapters were his because you got no setting. Zaylee's, you got some setting and you got the bluntness. Amari's was, for me, the most different. And I will acknowledge that there is some difference between them, but for him, it just wasn't enough. I think part of the problem is that first person is such a personal viewpoint that, like, small differences I don't think are quite enough. Because, like, you guys are right. I'm sure that, I didn't notice it, but I'm sure that stuff is true. But it's such a small difference when first person is, like, a person talking to you. People talk so much different. I think if this was third person, I wouldn't have noticed it because third person to begin with is more kind of distance from the character's voice. Like if you contrast something like this versus like the poet's tale in Hyperion, that is a story that is told by a person. Like it's so set in his personality. Or even we talked about this as well in Spinning Silver. All nine characters have first person viewpoints, but they all feel very different. Very Wanda different feels like she's like cheap with her words. She doesn't want to let them go. So she's very laconic yeah, in that Yeah, like she way. doesn't know how yeah. to use her words. So like, I do think there's a way to do it, but I feel like that's one of the reasons three viewpoints I think was a little bit too much. Um, and I think it's a weakness and makes the, to me, it made the characters feel very kind of samey and shallow. And this is one of those things because Will and I spoke about this a bit before as well, where I said, it's not that she's doing the bad job at this. She's not like, Novik is masterful when she takes her nine different characters. They weren't actually nine. But the nine different characters all in first person and they all- I kind of step on as three. <laughs> That's actually fair. That's very fair. But yeah, Stepan, Stepan had felt like a child. And it, again, it was first person yeah. narration, but he felt like a child. So like Adeyemi is not doing anything masterful in the way her point of views are being utilized. But I think it's because she was not here to write an atmospheric, personal, gross thing. I, She's telling a story she wants to tell. Exactly. And so for me, it wasn't necessarily like a bad thing, but it was not a plus. Like I would not praise yeah. the point of views. It's it's a mediocre utilized and, and and I'm not using mediocre as in a, like that was a bad like it's get, it's getting the job done it's it's doing it's average it's doing what she needs it to do but it is not a plus. So ironically, we never got to the pistola time, and now we don't have enough time to do it. What pistola thing? The the big disagreement me and Maria have about this book. I I will okay. summarize it really well. Wait or really okay. quick. Okay, you just you summarize it very well. Will has a problem, and and they're granted valid problem. I don't have this problem because for me it's a genre trope that I have just accepted. Selective exceptionalism. <laughs> you say it, Will. You, you, you do the thing. The thing about it is, why is magic coming back a good thing? Because magic inherently gives certain people not all men are created equal with magic. They should all have the same rights, but they're not going to. Some people are going to be more powerful than other people, and that's not really cool. That's not an okay thing. Ubermen and eugenics, like, I don't, I don't love it. And this book does a thing where you can actually just get rid of magic. You don't have to kill all of the magic users, but the author wants to tie those two ideas together when they don't. There's a very simple scalpel way of getting rid of it. And I think this is something where her 
bringing real world frustration into it kind of doesn't work as well. And I would have liked to see more tension. I would have liked to see Anand's view of like, hey, it's not okay. Some people are better than other people inherently. And then Zelly could have been like, well, maybe or maybe not, but my marginalized group needs this right now. That's an interesting conflict. And also it could have been contrasted against other forms of um, inherent power. Like being born rich is a superpower. I'm sorry, guys. I'm, I'm, I'm one of the proles. I am a communist to my heart. Being born rich is a superpower. I mean, look, we all watch Hassan Pike. So <laughs> what does that say? All you got to do is Google that if you don't know who he is. And it explains everything. Well, I know why you and Maria watch him. I'm just kidding. He's a very handsome man to me as well. Listen, <laughs> Hassan. But that was my inherent problem with it is that I'm not okay with it. Maria says that this is just a genre thing and like I didn't have a problem with it in Avatar. It is. So a couple of things. One, Avatar is a children's show. This has torture and a lot more mature themes. This is more of like YA in terms of late teenagehood. Two, I think that I just haven't read a lot of fantasy like this in a really long time. I mean, again, before the 12 books we've read now, I basically just read fanfic for like three years. And before that, I read nothing. So this is like actually the first time I'm running into a magic system where there is a lot of magic and it is a generic, genetically decided one. And so for me, like, I'm not cool with it. I'm kind of, I'm not on the king's side in terms of genocide, but I'm kind of like, I don't think it's a great thing to have magic, guys. I wouldn't want that in like the normal world. But for me, because, and this is why it's important that Will and I are coming to this from different places. I have read a ton. Harry Potter, Avatar, Korra, uh, not that the, those are books, but I've interacted with a lot of- One thing I will say is that I think of the way Maria's thinking about it too, is in terms of genre convention. So like, yes. for example, it's never, it's never examined in Star Wars, for example, that there's a whole slave class of droids like we're just not supposed to think about it which i don't love right but you're just kind of supposed to be like okay this is not the real world this is an abstracted exactly. version and stylized version in avatar 2 i think it was a problem when it decided to acknowledge it in legend of Korra because the world was not actually meant to have that much weight also in harry potter i think one of the problems with harry potter is the later books try to take this world building more seriously when it was never designed to maintain that kind of real world weight of oppression and things like that and so i do understand that point of view but for me i just kept being like i kind of think the king has a point here guys aside from the genocide part i feel like if you watch like invincible uh, like the way the supers uh just like annihilate incredibles no 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 there is one called the invisibles on uh amazon right it's the one it, it's the the one with the dude the young boy and he has his face smushed into a subway of like millions of people and they all get annihilated my point is though right is like a real world like that is freaking terrifying, terrifying. Yes. the amount of destruction so yeah uh i think uh inan could have been the good middle ground between and i think that's what they're the author's going for i don't know it's 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 weird because i just didn't notice that like i'm so used no, to either. this as a genre convention and and that's the difference is for me it's like I read a lot of stuff that where this is a thing that happens and it just it's part of the world and so for me it wasn't like it would be like oh vampires drink blood this is a problematic like yeah it's vampire books like yeah the one thing I will say though is that this book draws attention to it in terms of there is a plot to get rid of magic entirely like an avatar there isn't a conflict between benders and non-benders like that just isn't a thing that's brought up so there's a certain extent to which you're like okay whatever in this book it's explicitly brought up would it have worked better for you if magic could not be destroyed? Like if, if magic had never been destroyed, but they were just being subjugated. I still think there should be someone who talks about how it's kind of not cool that certain people are born with more prob with more power. I, again, I think that would be a more interesting discussion to have, but I wouldn't find, yeah, I wouldn't be like the king has a point here. It's like, okay, but you can't kill a whole race of people to get rid of magic. It's a really interesting thing because Will's right in a realistic setting. I wouldn't like that. Just like I wouldn't like actual vampires. I think the problem is that for me, I'm just not willing to accept that as a basic premise. And so for me, her bringing it up opens that Pandora's box. For me, it made it interesting as a reader, as I would like, once I got to that point. Now, unfortunately, Will had already mentioned these concerns. So when the book started bringing it up, it brought the conversation to the forefront. I would have liked to have read it and seen how I would have reacted to this without having the voice of Will uh, on the side. The voice like, of Will. Mentioning that. I'm sorry, guys. 
I'm stuck with my voice in my head too. I don't like it. But like, I go to you for that. We talk about that the entire time. So like, I knew a lot of his issues with this before we started this video. They, none of That's why we have right. pistolas, which I've noticed pistolas. you didn't bring one. I have pistolas. I, I I don't, I have a dog. No, she has a defender. She's called forth her representative. This is this is her second in the duel. No, yes. pistolas. Yeah. No, this is my, well, my you can't, battle no, hound. She wins. What a derpy animal. She wins automatically. It's because you won't shoot a dog. Yeah, I dare you. Look at that face. Oh hey, I've gotten into fights with dogs. I have scars because of dogs. Do. This was defending do. my small dog. From an, another bigger dog. But anyway. So that is Children of Blood and Bone. <laughs> I, I enjoyed it. If you like YA and you're okay with these kinds of tropes, and, and also if you don't mind romances coming together very quickly, uh, you'll enjoy this. I enjoyed it. I, I would have changed things. I would have liked some things done, but I enjoyed this book. It wasn't necessarily fun. But I enjoyed it. Tomi Adeyemi did a stellar job, though, on her first, first novel. Yes. Like, okay. congratulations right. to her, though. Look, I know. I just, okay, look, I became fond of her in the interviews, okay? And also, she's only 24. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that her book is good. I would say that I don't think the book is good, but if, you, if you've read books like this before, you will like this book. I think that's a fair thing to say. I, like, I don't think I fundamentally disagree. I just don't think it's also a very good book. So uh, hit the like button, comment, subscribe. What did you guys think of the book? What did you think of any of the topics we talked about? Inherent Uberman magic. Is that a genre convention or eugenics? What did you think of the point of views? Do you miss, do you dislike first person? What are some questions you guys have? Do you prefer to only have one or two point of views? Is three too many? That is it. Thank you so much for listening. We will talk to you guys later. Bye. Bye, -bye my social darling. Bye.